On Terminator Salvation, we decided to do something a little bit different. Ultimately, one of the fighters is going to be uh, Computer Graphics T-800. To give the actors something to fight against, it's really good to have a stuntman there doing the role of the Terminator. It helps the actors on set to complete their performance, and it helps us as a good reference point for how the character will interact with the, with the actual actor. The stuntman has to wear a Velcro suit because he wears these very special tracking markers that makes it easy for us to track what he's doing in the computer. What happens there is we have layout, track, every little thing like we're tracking the helicopter, we're tracking the boot that gets torn off of his foot. And then what happens is animation gets in, we utilize the iMocap suit and we start tracking in the movements and recreating the performance. When we showed them the previous take of this, which matches the action really well, it just didn't feel threatening enough. So we pushed the performance so we're actually coming into the helicopter two or three more feet. But that's the advantage of kind of having mo eye mocap to start off with and then being able to change the performance to suit what's needed to tell the story. We have to recreate the 3D environment. So when we put our virtual puppet in it that we animate and we render it, it will, it will just match and fit into the space. We have this scrum sphere that will give us the information of what is behind the scene, what we can see, and that tells us the sky was fairly blue and there's a lot of dirt and warm dirt information. So what we do is we create a sort of environment that is a neutral environment, and this is what we call a turntable. All these information are painted by our artists, and our artists will define okay, this is a piece of cloth, this is metal that should look like this, that has been weathered that way, and they work together to, to make it look real. And then once that is done, the technical director is the person who's gonna light. We take that information, put that in the shot, and looks how it looks. And then we will do the same sort of beauty lighting that a DP would do on set. It takes a lot of computer power and technology and skill on the part of the artist to make that happen. We worked very intimately with the Air Force at Kirtland Air Force Base there in New Mexico and they were cool because they let us use the uh, Pavehawk H-60 helicopter which is featured in the film, C-130s, A-10s and a great many of their machines, you know, uh, also the Osprey which is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft which is marvel of scientific achievement. So it was great to have all that hardware there and for real and that's just one more contribution to the realism of the film. Most of our toys here are Air Force toys, so we went to Chuck Davis, who's the coordinator of uh, all DOD, Department of Defense Coordination in uh, Los Angeles as a motion picture liaison, and he introduced us to the Air Force, and they have just opened the doors to us. As we read the script, we're breaking it down much like a unit production manager does. Uh, when does the production company want to film the movie? Where do they want to film it? What types of military equipment is necessary to support the storyline as assets? And then we put it all together. It's like putting a huge puzzle together. Our initial discussions with uh, the production company revealed that they wanted and needed the A-10 aircraft in their movie. Also, we had the very uh, delightful discovery that there was a female A-10 fighter pilot. One of the heroes of the movie is a female A-10 fighter pilot. So we put the best of both worlds together. I was called in to help um, Moon Bloodgood, the main actress, with her role as a female A-10 pilot. So obviously the gun is what we're all centered around. Right. She's been definitely showing her the ropes. And uh, they got her into a flight suit. They got her down into a simulator. Uh, they took her through all of the different uh, uh, briefings. So I really watched her and talked a lot with her about what would I have, would I have a G-suit on, making it so that it's as believable as possible. Really, I'm just trying to coordinate with Moon to see what I could do to help her out and exactly what, you know, she thought she would benefit from my knowledge. We love working with the movie guys, and my job is to basically run around and make sure that everybody's playing well together, that everybody's listening to one another, that uh, the production guy says, I need this, and the maintenance guy says, I need this. My job is to come in and say, well, how can we do this a different way? And then everybody is happy. And cut, cut. Very, very nice. It's critical to us to make you feel like you're really fighting this war. And you can't do that in the absence of that hardware. 
if I'm just on a soundstage and telling the actors to imagine that a C-130 is there, that does not get me the same result as a C-130 being there as a PAVOC helicopter with its incredible downwash taking off and landing, getting everybody's head right. The molten metal definitely scared the hell out of me. Luckily on set, you don't actually have time to worry so much about how you're doing that. You just sort of say, okay, we're gonna have to work on that. Get some guy, get some guy working on fluid sims back at ILM so we can hopefully be all right. Well, these are some movies showing how we developed the lava. Our fluid supervisor took our current simulation technology and we started running sim takes, just taking the animation and the iterations of the animation and just getting a look of how he's gonna cover it, how viscous it was gonna be, how much we wanted to see of his face, how he'd get out of it, that kind of thing. We then started working with smooth particle hydrodynamics, which is where you start simulating with lots of little particles, but they all interact. So if you start pulling some, then the others will fall. And it's really got a physical, when you, when you start playing with it and start running simulations, it really feels like a liquid. And the whole system works with particles, but it works off temperature. You set the initial temperature, the temperature cools down, and the temperature is then driving the viscosity, and the viscosity also drives the temperature. It's sort of a, a whole system where you, you just have to hit go and you start getting these really cool effects. So the end started using this in, in conjunction with the fluid sim. It actually worked really well doing the two together. And we could also use it to interact with him. So here's a, a shot where he's walking out of the lava. And again, we'd sort of drizzle, as a starting point, drizzle it over him. And then he could just start walking through it. And it, as he walks through it, it kicks off into the distance. It's actually great fun to use. Fluid sim can take a long time to render, I mean, to create the simulation it itself. So the turnaround is very slow. And it's the kind of things that you still want to art direct or you still want to say, no, I want that to happen at that frame. And I want that, you know, oh, okay, now we need to change the animation. Oh, now we change the animation. We need to re -seam to be sure that we're on sync. So we tag them and we say, okay, that one, we know that we're gonna have to start early just to be sure. So you don't want to keep that for the last minute thinking, oh, we forgot that shot. We built a gas station from the ground up and it's kind of funny because many people drove by saying, how did you guys find this location? I mean, that's a compliment to the construction and, and paint department. It was a barren desert. We brought some graders in, plowed out the field and built it from the ground up. It's a gas station. It was created as a set, but it was built as a structural element. So then we had to go in and weaken the building and uh, remove components so that we could cause that to collapse. And then we have to put our charges in to create the fireball. When the charge goes off, it blows the fireball out in the direction we aim it. The philosophy in the film has been to do as much here practically as we can. So, you know, where you know, we might have done, say, the fire's miniature or some kind of digital fire in a different movie. Shut it down! We really have been trying to keep these full-scale effects that we can, we can shoot with our, you know, sort of traditional camera gear. And uh, we will uh, create computer-generated harvester to sort of match into that photography. So we had to take a 28-foot tanker and uh, recreate it with lightweight, thin materials that we could blow up safely. So we've basically fabricated the thing loaded it with explosives and gasoline. And what we're gonna do is we're going to, when a tow truck gets to the street at a mark, we're gonna push the button. The tanker's gonna explode. 350 milliseconds later, the gas station, just the back half of it, is gonna blow up with a big fireball. And then another 350 milliseconds later, the gas station is gonna have the final fireball. So it's like a three-stage explosion and several hundred gallons of gasoline and a very large fireball and a big debris radius. I think they have six cameras on it and one helicopter. The camera people, they all start their cameras on remote switches and get in a truck and drive away. There's cameras up close that are protected in crash housings. Physically, the cameras are fine. You know, the heat's just a few seconds and then it's over with. This is the explosion point. This is where the truck will be when the tanker first goes up. In a 200 foot area, there's gonna be plastic, wood, and sheet metal falling out of the air. How high is the fireball on that? On the last one? Yeah. On the last one, the fireball is probably uh, probably maybe 80 feet in the air and 80 feet in diameter. Okay. <laughs> then as Gary will say, three, two, one, action, Jim. There'll be action on the truck, counter move on the left, 
the helicopter will be out here, we'll get that, and then bang. That was part of the joy of the picture, was to create that heat and that impact of the fire really being in your face. A lot of eyebrows were lost, but here we are. One shot in the movie that was particularly uh, challenging compositing-wise was Christian Bale's entrance to the movie where he uh, lands on a helicopter in the midst of a, a huge battle scene. As far as McGee was concerned, it was all about getting more and more mayhem into those shots. There is always specific shots that you know, okay, these ones, we're gonna start on them very early on and they're gonna go until the end. So for instance, one of them, there is like five different background plates and we have to recreate the entire background. We have to blend the different plates and stuff. So this kind of shot, we start very early and we say, okay, this is a problematic shot. We're gonna put a crew on it. So what we're seeing here as the camera pans around the scene is uh, several di different plates which are basically stitched together. This dish is a miniature dish um, which we actually blew up at Kerner. You'll see in the foreground here there's a CG shockwave element right here that leads into a series of practical uh, dust and dirt elements. And then in behind it drops in uh, the Stan Winston uh, puppet of the T-600. Then in the back of the shot, a CG plane is coming in, basically shooting at, uh, strafing the ground where that Stan Winston puppet is. We have the plates of the uh, soldiers landing in the helicopters. Uh, these helicopters in behind are actually CG helicopters. There's satellite dishes everywhere. Uh, we, we used miniature elements for those. We basically theorize what's gonna happen here. and We, we, we visualize how this thing's gonna come apart, how it's going to crack, fracture. Uh, we may go on YouTube and look at, you know, um, some post-war VLAs from somewhere in the world and see, okay, what did they do after they were actually hit with a, with a surface-to-air missile or whatever it is? This is basically an early animation movie of this shot. You can see by looking here basically how rough everything is. And you can also see really clearly where the different plates come together that make up the shot. No work has been done here yet except just basically planning the shot. We have a very simple uh, CG dishes standing in for the miniature elements that we would shoot. You can see basically where um, one plate leads into the next, leads into the next, and it get, gives you some idea of the challenges uh, you know, that we're basically facing in a shot like this. The Terminator films have consistently sort of trodden on new ground and developed new techniques. On Terminator 2, they had, you know, new uses of morphing and the chrome man was a landmark in computer graphics. And Terminator Salvation gave us a chance to push the envelope as well ourselves. For the destruction of Skynet sequence, Kerner created a couple of different size miniatures for the different shots, uh, 24th scale and 48th scale. To do the tower, we thought, well, this thing has to come completely apart. It has to look like it's completely blowing up. However, we had already done a building that crumbled earlier in the film, and it was pretty extensive. There was a lot of rigging involved, so we decided that we were going to build basically everything that was the structure of the building out of glass. And inside the building, we erected a mortar tree. So the idea was that the mortars would be packed with high explosives. The mortars would go off in sequence heading up the building, and there would be nothing holding them back because everything was constructed from glass. And then when the thing goes off, there's so much debris. It's just a tremendous explosion, a tremendous event. They essentially built about a 10 square block miniature. You know, we have lots of building remnants, you know, uh, San Francisco-esque remnants, apartment structures, stuff like that. Mixed in, you can see some of the mechanical um, remnants of Skynet. All of the buildings were constructed in a rather strange way, actually. We used ceiling panel material, we call it homosote, and we cross-cut it so it was only about a quarter of an inch thick and then we laser cut it so it all had the right window configuration and door configurations and the look of a wall of an industrial building. There were mortars around the base of the tower that were actually blowing outward. 
So the mortars were huge, and they were packed with gravel and a tremendous amount of pyrotechnics. So these basically cardboard buildings once hit with these gigantic shotgun blasts were just instantly leveled. We did everything on this show in one take. So when we crumbled the building, we had one chance at it. So it's all theory on our part as to what's gonna happen, how this thing's gonna come down, what are the course of events. We used miniatures because if we wanna blow up a building, it's still one of the best ways. Plus, it's a lot more fun than sitting watching a computer screen doing simulation after simulation. To get out there at night, set off an explosion and watch the building come down. Face it, it's cool. If you could do it, you would do it too. Hydrobots live in the water. Why are they called Hydrobots? Because you and I fought them one day and they lived in the water and we said Hydrobots. I guess the first description of them is they were just more kind of snaky, uh, plated things, much more simplistic. And then the art department started sketching and uh, it, it ended up being far more interesting. This feels like a, a workable, a workable side. It's got to be able to poke through the um, the bubble on the bottom, you know, where the foot pedals are. The best. I like the scale. The scale that suggests like clamps. Yep. Okay. So it's just like that just goes in and destroys, and this clamps and holds. You just got to make sure well, it has that level of menace. This is the first time we actually see a Terminator in the water. So here we actually took the design. Uh, by looking at eels. The way the eels actually work, work their way through the water, we actually took that design and then came up with how would you actually make that work? You know, when it actually moves through, what do you actually need? You need to have a pivot point here and a twisting point there. And we engineered the thing to actually work just like Mother Nature does. They turned out pretty wicked, pretty vicious with these clamping, pincher-like things on the front of it, and then also an auger kind of drill bit. So once they got hold of you, you were, you were definitely be finished. You can see how intricate he is with all the parts. And for what he's had to go through in the film, he had to be both durable and lightweight. Some of it's rubber pieces that have been finished to look like metal, but then there is metal structure inside. So this was a very intricate build. These Hydrobots were, were challenging, not only because of how detailed they were, they had the circumstances that they were going to be in. They were going to get punished pretty hard. They're thrown around. They have to work in water. So that adds a whole new variable there. Some of the radio controls, uh, uh, RC devices and things that you would usually use are kind of out the window. It needed to be durable enough to be wrestled and thrown around and chucked out of helicopters and punched through things but at the same time not be so unwieldy that you couldn't puppet it and, and make it work. This is a fun one. <laughs> I don't want it to feel like we got, you know, a, a contemporary aged Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. And we should also just take the pain if that can't be done. If it's never gonna feel realistic a, because yeah. I don't want, it can't bump the movie. It can't be like a giggle. It's gotta be like a great, Moment. In this film, we bring to life a digital version of Arnold Schwarzenegger as he was in Terminator 1 and have him fight Christian Bale. It was a great help to have a body double in for, the, for our T-800. You know, that way you have all of the eye lines and you have them really interacting with something as they're fighting. OK, a couple of shadowy shots. We want to get the hint that it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then we start filming it, and we, she's like, OK. He starts going in for close-ups on the guy that's playing the body of the T-800 and says, you know, Ben, I really want to challenge you with this. You know, we're going to be right in the face. You guys are going to have to bring your best game for this. So I challenged ILM, Ben Snow in particular, what can you do to create an early 80s Arnold Schwarzenegger photorealistically appearing in our film in 2009? Like, OK. This isn't what we signed on for, but it's fantastically exciting, so yeah, okay. A bodybuilder acted the role, and then we had to replace various parts of him with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So for our digital Arnold, we started with a live cast that Stan Winston and his group did during Terminator 1. 
it was a really good foundation to start off on because we didn't have anything uh, physically that was usable to recreate Arnold from that era. We had to use new skin technologies to make his skin look real. We developed hair materials and shaders to make his hair look real. You know, lots and lots of hand tweaking. Every little angle, you notice something different. It's, you know, his upper lip is too big, it's too small, his, why is his eye so squinty? And it's just hundreds and, you know, of iterations of sort of noodling to get the, the likeness from every angle. At one point we had a conference call with Stan Winston Studios. One of the first things they said was, well, of course, with all the makeup, you know, they'd cover him in KY jelly. Yeah, that's why he looks so shiny. Then the other thing they'd say was, one of the major things we were missing was that as soon as he went into character, he would clench his jaw, which made him look very different. It was things like that where it was just, it was invaluable to do the archaeology. It's even hard for me to tell where they blended it, but they're, they're blending in our CG chest with his upper torso. The team at ILM has really pulled together to produce this digital army. It wasn't a clear-cut process. It's one that has involved all the different departments. And at the end of it, I think we've produced something amazing. We're all here because of the great thing Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jim Cameron put together in those pictures. It just felt like the proper thing to do to tip the cap, respect the fan base, and give back a little bit. Here we are in the heart of it all. This is the Terminator factory. We've never seen this before in any of the Terminator movies. Here we actually get to come to their home, see where they're being built. Now these heads of the Terminators, because there is a stunt that's involved, not only do they have to look good, but they also have to be squashy as well, so that as the people come down, they don't hurt themselves. This thing is on a track system that goes backwards and forwards to allow us to work it in our shot. So not only are they fighting a Terminator, running from a Terminator, but these things are moving throughout the shot and moving in their way. Special effects came in and rigged it from the top. Obviously, the whole thing is manufactured so it can actually move, but they're responsible for making it move within the shot. So they rigged it all with a series of cables and wires and pulled it, and uh, also had a whole series of jets of plumes of smoke and nitrogen coming down there as well just to make it come to life. On Terminator Salvation, we decided to do something a little bit different. We engaged the stunt team and said, OK, guys, what is the most kick-ass fight you guys can come up with? But rather than like a normal fight, you're superhuman now. You can throw each other through walls and through pipes and you're going to fall from a great height and be covered with molten metal and still keep coming. You've got these powers, but we want it to be a real fight. We want to feel the punches connect. You're working with somebody that's supposed to be a Terminator, so obviously it's not going to be as fluid as what people are going to see in an actual wrestling match, anything like that. So it has to be a little bit blocky and robotic but we're trying to get the other guys to be a little bit more fluid. If you remember the previous Terminators, it was very grab, shake, slam into a wall. So we're keeping that kind of element for the actual Terminators, but a very street, very aware of the, your surroundings style of fighting for the human. This is my third film with Christian. I double Christian on both Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. And working with him on this, I know how he performs, how he moves, what works for him, what doesn't, so that I can put things quicker and, if need be, change things on the day. It's annoying, really, because it took me 20 years to master some stuff, and then I'll show him twice and he'll, he'll just do it. We had the luxury of designing everything within my art department. We have an amazing group of people in Stan Winston who then took those designs and turned them into the reality of the 3D guys you see running around. I don't believe in leaning on CG. I love computer-generated enhancement, but I want to build everything practically. The whole point of this film was to feel it. There was a team of about 60 people working back at Stan Winston's studio uh, on all the different variety of these things. So what I've got here is fully working Terminator skull. These are T1s now that we've gotten some paint on them. You can see that they're, we've got the aging and weathering coming about on them. Basically what we're doing is we're swapping back and forth between fogged contact lenses and clear contact lenses just to see which reads better. 
This is the foam team, and they're, they're running foam rubber. These chemicals, there are many parts that get mixed together in, in a special formula, and they're, they're whipped up. It's almost like a crazy bakery. McGee has always been a fan of trying to get as much on screen that's real and live as possible. You know, it helps your actors get more involved and it gives great onset sensibility. You know, when, when this comes walking in the frame and it's seven foot three, you can sure have quite a reaction to that. I think it's been fun for us because, you know, we get the opportunity to build all this cool stuff. We're doing a little test fitting right now with his underskull. That's the underbase, and then we're going to end up with with the red LED lights in there, and then we get the skin on here. Okay. So this is actually first test fitting here. Feels great. Good first. It's going to be a fun character. This one. Audiences are so sophisticated that I think whatever you can do to make their film going experience more exciting and. and uh, Fool them, you know? Give them that magic trick that they're coming to see and make it really believable. I think that's what we've got to keep pushing to do. With the Stan Winston guys, you know, just seeing the dedication that people like this have, you know, the, the painstaking detail that they go to, you know, talents that they have, and the patience that they have is incredible. And I love it when you see people who are just obsessed with what they do and they want to, you know, perfect what a T600 really would look like, you know, turning its head and attacking somebody. They take it very, very seriously and I think that's wonderful. It's fun those days when you have practical effects and you go talk to the effects guys and you say, I want it bigger than Apocalypse Now. I want to feel the heat coming off and I want to know that we made our mark and that concussion is felt throughout the Western United States. We figure out where the napalm drop will be, we figure out how big it'll be, then we'll make a protective fire ring around it. So if something does go wrong, it burns to the end of the fire break and stops. And then the effects guys come in and design the shot and they figure out how many gallons of gas they need, where they're gonna blow it up. We consult with the fire department, show them what we have in mind, get the proper backups with water trucks, fire trucks, whatever you need, and then just set it off and film it. Mike Menardis and McGee have a standard repartee. Uh, Mike says, how big do you want it? And McGee says, Bigger. Mike is the chairman of Big around here, and he has blown up a lot of stuff, and we've gone through an incredible amount of pyrotechnics. To make up the napalm run, we have eight inch PVC pipe in 20 foot sections, and we have 22 of them. They hold 50 gallons of fuel each, and then we have um, trap mortars, which is a big, thick V pan that's full of sawdust and diesel fuel and gasoline. We have those lean towards the direction that we want the napalm run. And then we have DSC sparks that go off to simulate the phosphorus. It's a 300 foot run of gasoline, 1,500 gallons of gasoline, uh, 300 foot high flame. We started at one end and detonated the charges and the containers of gas chasing up to the point where he is. We just stop like right here because uh, the orange tubing that's coming out of the ground is the non-electric tubing on the end of that's the detonators. Shrapnel from the pipe flies 200 feet in every direction. The radiant heat from the fireball is dangerous under 300 feet. So uh, we clear everybody, you know, well back. We got two helicopters in the air, and then all our cameras are off to that side over there. I do remember signing a bill for about 30,000 gallons of uh, diesel fuel, which he blew up in one day. Um, I was rather impressed with that. You know, go for it. Be bigger. This is big. McGee really wanted real pyro events and explosions and action sort of at uh, at one-to-one -one scale, you know, in our sets and not do them as uh, as computer generated or as miniatures. So, uh, you know, all this stuff plays really big. I want that war reality because you get it in the whites of the actor's eyes. So when you do things practically, I think it results in a lot more grit.